knock. Hi. Welcome, everyone, to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken. I'm Lady Glockenflecken. Together we are the Glockenfleckens, and we have an exciting show for you today with a great guest, uh, one that you may not have ever thought would actually come on a podcast with me, uh, in Dr. Christopher Longhurst, who is a chief medical officer at UCSD Health. So that was exciting. But before we get into that, um, something in my life has 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 returned, uh, and that is physical activity. <laughs> I I so I've been I'm fairly athletic. I would consider yeah. myself athletic. I played high school sports, and I have played competitive ultimate frisbee. I know some people are probably laughing at that. In fact, mm-hmm. it's it's I'm somewhat of a cliche being like a. a ultimate frisbee person who also tells jokes i'm like the quintessential hippie for most people uh but i played competitive ultimate frisbee for 15 years a long time long time and it really up until the pandemic hit and then i just like most people just stopped kind of doing things and it wasn't until um like last month that I decided to get back out into like a competitive sports space mm-hmm. and it came in the form of indoor soccer. Mm-hmm. But it's like, it's a really cute kind of league <laughs> because it's an all ages co-ed. So it's, it's men and women and, uh, and it's our, our team name. So first of all, our team is made up of, uh, a lot of da- moms and dads, in fact, almost all moms and dads, were all at least 35 years old. And not just moms and dads. This is why it's cute. It's because it's the moms and dads of the children who are on our daughter's soccer team. Yeah, like half the team is like, yeah, the, we're the parents of our children. They're all on the same team. So we all, we know each other from like soccer games and practices and stuff. We're like, hey, let's... We like soccer. Let's go. Let's let's form this indoor soccer team and 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 see how it goes. So you our, should name your team based off of the name of the well, children's team. Oh, the our children's team is uh, the um, uh, Jelly Bean Jelly Bean Tigers. Tigers. The Jelly Bean Tigers. Uh, but our we actually have a name for our team. Oh, you do. What is it? Yeah, it's Bedtime at Eight. <laughs> Perfect. That is, legit, that is actually our name. <laughs> bedtime at Eight. Uh, and at first, I thought this was like an over thirty league. Mm. I was mistaken. Uh oh. I would. This is an all ages league, and the reason I know this: first couple of games went great. Uh, we we tied the first one, and we lost the second one by one one goal. So it was it was very close, very you know pretty competitive. We had a lot of fun, and then we played the team made up of teenagers. Oh boy, they showed up. Legit high school team, like a varsity high school team. <laughs> they ran us off the field. <laughs> the the uh, the amount, the stamina, the energy, it was overwhelming. And all of us, like our goal is just to not get hurt. <laughs> like if we score goals, great. But if we can escape these games without seriously injuring ourselves, that's a win. Isn't it depressing that you used to be, we all did, used to be like those teenagers, like that used oh, to yeah. be. And in everyone's minds, you're still kind of there yeah. until you get out there and actually oh, try it. I remember like when you were, when I was like, you know, 17, 18, just I could get out of bed and immediately start sprinting. Yeah. Like my legs would <laughs> tear off my body if I tried to do that now. <laughs> and and so and this was like a the a perfect storm of like the old people, mm-hmm. you know, st- who still think they got it mm-hmm. to a certain extent, uh trying not to get hurt and then this high school varsity soccer team who like the way they play like is like they will never get hurt ever. Like it's impossible for them to get injured. And so that's the way they play. And it was it posed a very serious threat to our way of playing of not getting hurt. And so uh, um, there were some some pulled hammies, <laughs> a couple a couple of uh, of rolled ankles. I just started cramping by the end of it. Um, and 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 we're, <laughs> it's, 
And this it was like twenty minute halves, so it, was, it wasn't like uh, you know we'd all play for like five minutes at a time, if that. Um, and so it was. We lost, obviously. <laughs> It was <laughs> yeah. I wonder which team eight, had less fun. Eight to three. Oh, they were they were having a ton of fun. They were <laughs> okay. enjoying themselves. Thought maybe it'd be too easy. Oh no! Are you kidding me? Like it always feels good to blow out That's old true. people. Yeah. And so uh, we lost eight to three. I scored two goals because nice. see, whenever I played soccer growing up, I was a forward. So I was like, I I scored a bunch of goals. Like I'm yeah. really I I I feel like I'm pretty good at scoring goals. Sure. And I scored. Two goals against high schoolers. That's nothing I'm to I'm very proud of at. that. Yeah. That's <laughs> you should, right. You should all be very proud of me. You know, I am surprised. I was when it started, and I have just continued to be surprised at how early you start to get old. Right? Like, yeah. I thought maybe I would start feeling old when I was a, a teenager. I thought I'd start feeling old in, like, you know, my 40s. Mm-hmm. It starts like started earlier. 29, 30. Uh, For me, it did. I was like, yeah. I mean, not not a lot. It goes, it's yeah. gradual. But that's when I first started noticing like, hmm, I'm not as spry as I once was. Yeah, I feel like, thir- like yeah, like 31, 32. Yeah. It's like, like all of a yeah. sudden you're just like, got it. you can't. Take me off guard. You, you move your neck a certain way and your week is ruined. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> that, that, that kind of stuff starts happening. So enjoy your youth, everyone. That's right. Uh, enjoy your athletic youth years to really get the most out of those things uh because uh, eventually you're going to find yourself on a on an over 35 indoor soccer team playing against high schoolers and feeling your age that's right at least you made it this far i had to i had to peek out at 15 in gymnastics that's <laughs> yeah. gymnastics that's hard age in the 15. body all right well let's let's get to the our guest today let's do how it. about it uh so again this is uh christopher longhurst md uh he is the chief medical officer and chief digital officer at uc san diego health associate dean and professor of medicine and pediatrics at ucsd school of medicine so he's a pediatrician and a chief medical officer or as our daughter likes to say a kidiologist oh yes yes she dropped that one we have a very funny we have two very funny daughters, uh, but our youngest dropped the kidiologist because she couldn't come up with the name. What is a type of doctor that takes care of kids? Kidiologist? Kidiologist. I, it makes it perfect makes sense. sense. I think logical. Probably should be called that from now on. All right. Well, let's get to it. I'm excited about this. Yeah, he's fun. All right. Here's Chris. All right. So we got Chris Longhurst coming to us from San Diego. Uh, and you look like you're at work. You're wearing a, a, a white button up collar shirt with a tie. And I do not look nearly as professional as you. So thanks for bringing some, uh, sense of professionalism to this recording. This is great. You bet. I like to wear a tie every now and then just so that my uh, boss stays on her feet, <laughs> you know, worries that I'm out interviewing somewhere. Did you, did you, you didn't just do it for me. It's for your boss. No, it wasn't just for you. <laughs> we thought the joint commission might show up today. Oh my God. <laughs> is that, is that a possibility? <laughs> it is a possibility. We're, we are in our window. So how does that work? So you, so they, they contact you say, Hey, we're going to come. Uh, wait, wait, what is the Joint oh, yeah, Commission? Good, uh, good, for, for people who don't know. Yeah, actually, Chris, why don't you tell us who the Joint Commission is? The Joint Commission is a accreditation agency that makes sure that we are, uh, as a hospital, complying with all the CMS regulations. And so um, and it's a big we're, deal. we're always excited when they show up. Because if you lose your... <laughs> he's shaking his head no. Because if, <laughs> if you lose your accreditation... Uh, the everybody has to find a new job, right? That's how it works. You definitely don't want to lose accreditation because billing CMS is an important part of paying all of our employees. Uh, so, okay, so they give you a window. Like, how how long is your window? It's like when the plumber comes to your house and you got to sit around all afternoon. They show up at the very it's end. It's way worse than that. <laughs> it's horrible, Kristen. So they give you like a three month window, but you usually kind of get a hint so that it's like here or there. We got a hint that it was maybe on one of our blackout weeks because we had a blackout day, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, but, um, I canceled a trip to, uh, a family trip in November because we thought they were coming and, uh, here it is in, uh, February and they haven't shown up yet. So we're excited to welcome them sometime soon. So, so (laughs) so you. So you have an, do you, there's like an insider? There's, do you like have a mole at the CM? At, at <laughs> we a... wish we had a mole because then we'd know when they were coming, but we have no mole. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Uh, well, at least at, at least you are you're in San Diego, and is despite the stress of being an executive at a hospital, a big hospital system, um, doesn't it just make your life just so much better just being in San Diego? I say that as we're in the middle of winter in Portland, Oregon, and it's rainy and gray and awful year round. Dr. Flannery, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It, it doesn't suck here, but I don't want to really advertise it too much because we don't want anybody else here. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. So what I thought, what I wanted to do right now is, is give people an idea about what, what a CMO is, what, a, what, because in, in med, and I've been guilty of this, obviously I, of, of making fun of hospital administrators, uh, and, um, somewhat mercilessly, I think a lot of people, you're like a, a very common punching bag in the medical system. <laughs> and so, but I feel like maybe a lot of people don't really know exactly what it is you do. So, uh, give us a, a quick little rundown. Well, first of all, um, Dr. Flanny, your, your readers and listeners should know I'm a huge fan <laughs> and I particularly like it when you make fun of possible administrators because it resonates. You seem to capture it really well. But those are all the other people, not me, obviously. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I uh, grew up um, as a pediatrician, and uh, that's how I think of myself to this day. So I, I happen to serve as the chief medical officer and chief digital officer here at UC San Diego Health. And there's lots of fires that we put out every day and, and lots of great strategies we're putting in place as a team. But um, ultimately, my identity still is as a practicing doctor. Mm -hmm. And you do still practice. You're... Yeah, I get to see babies as part of our newborn service here at UCSD. And whenever you were going through your medical education in the early part of your career, did you ever imagine that you would be doing this in the administrator role? No, I most definitely did not. Now, I will say that um, my father was an academic physician, an MD-PhD. And he taught me that what he loved about his career is he got to do different things. He was in the lab some days, he was a cardiologist some days, and he was an administrator some days. And that definitely resonated with me. And so I stuck around in academic medicine because I knew I could wear different hats. But I didn't think that I would be an administrator like a chief medical officer. In fact, I still have imposter syndrome. <laughs> and I can tell you when I was appointed uh, a couple of years ago, it was like the worst imposter syndrome that I had had since intern year. Really? No, oh, yeah, big time. In what way? Well, you remember, um, Willie, you walk into your internship and uh, suddenly, you know, you can sign prescriptions and you have an MD after your name, but you don't know any more than you knew, you right. know, when you were a fourth year medical student. In fact, potentially less if you took some time off, right? Right, yeah. And so uh, you're walking around sort of feeling the weight of the world because your prescription error could harm another human being, right? And say, so look everything up, double and triple check it. And uh, I felt similarly then 20 years later becoming a chief medical officer. I had served in lots of other administrative roles as CMIO, as CIO, as associate chief medical officer. But suddenly one day I was in the seat that people who I had really admired uh, had sat in prior to me. And uh, it raised the bar quite a bit. And I thought, well, they can't really be looking to me as sort of the head of physicians, right? Right. And, and you're... <laughs> But they do look up to you. You're, you're, uh, no, no, they absolutely don't. In fact, that's how I got good? over it. As I realized that there's no respect, that nobody looks at me that way at all. Do they pity you instead for having to be the yeah. head of physicians? You know, it's funny when I talk to people and they say things like, Thanks for your time. I know you, you must be really busy with all the problems in the hospital. <laughs> and I think, Gosh, yeah, you're right. There's a lot of problems. Lot what of... what is in a CMO's job description? What are you? What all are you responsible for? Do you get all the complaints? Does it all Does it all come to you? Are you the complaint guy? You know, um, I try to help. Um, they don't all come to to me. We also have a physician group leader and other you know uh, doctors who are in our executive suite. Um, so we work together as a team. But uh, one of my primary roles as the chief medical officer is overseeing all of our medical directors. So, you know, a community hospital might have a few dozen uh, physicians with administrative funding for medical directorship in different areas or clinics or service lines, et cetera. And many academic medical centers, it's much larger. So here at UCSD, we've got uh, you know, over 150 medical directors that was common at Stanford, where I came from as well. 
And so all of those medical directors need to um, be aligned and, and uh, marching towards goals that help to the enterprise to better care for patients. So that's part of my role. That, um, that sounds really important. Yeah. And certainly not something that, that I don't think I could ever do. Um, and I, I'll, I'll stick to just skits. How about that? Just it dressing. probably involves a lot of like organization. But I, I am actually getting a lot of good ideas from your appearance here. I could really <laughs> kind of tailor my a hospital administrator, CEO character, uh, based on, you know, this interaction right now. Um, and so, uh, I, I do want to say that I'm, I'm glad that my depiction of, you know, people, leadership positions in a hospital uh, did not turn you off from from joining us today. So, <laughs> really, I, I'm curious. <laughs> he's undoing <laughs> he's, the tie. He's, he's taking off his tie. <laughs> um, uh, so, so now uh, joint commission's going to walk in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's probably uh, that's probably something that the joint commission requires is for you to. <laughs> wait, wait. Are how how far are we taking this? <laughs> <laughs> he's he's still going. Seems no. <laughs> like he's uh maybe getting undressed in there. So maybe we move it along. Uh, so when did when did you go through residency? How far was so it? I yeah. I uh, started with the class of two thousand medical school, but during medical school, I found that I had an interest in combining my passion for computers and information technology with healthcare delivery, and so I took some time off and did a master's degree in health informatics. So I, I finished medical school in two thousand one, and my residency training at Stanford was from two thousand one to two thousand four. As you well know, those are some of the uh, highlights of uh, everybody's career and definitely where memories are made. Yeah. Can you share some memories from that time in your life? Well, Will, Krista, I'm, I'm not a great sleeper. <laughs> I, I don't get to sleep easily. I don't stay asleep easily. So, you know, adjusting to life in the call room. It's funny because uh, you, just, you do kind of look like you just woke up, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Okay, keep going. Adjusting to life in the call room was difficult. And, uh, uh, especially when you're on call every fourth night, so you're, you're post call every fourth day, you, you know, it, it was a, a grind, particularly, you know, before work hour restrictions mm -hmm. when you would stay sometimes post call for continuity clinic, you know, all the way till five o'clock without sleep. So, um, I found that, uh, I had problems initially, um, waking up from my pager. Oh no. And, uh, a couple times, I mean, the nursing staff had to come like knock really loudly on the call room door because the pager was beeping, but I was just sleeping <laughs> right through it. Oh, no. Um, now, you know, to be honest, part of the reason I was sleeping through it is because I found I could get to sleep easier with earplugs in. Oh, okay. Um, and so the earplugs didn't, didn't help me hear the pager. Sure. Um, <laughs> and so then I started putting the pager on vibrate and I tried, you know, sticking on my pants, but roll off the scrubs. So finally I found that, um, a formula that worked for my entire residency, which was, I, I would go to the call room after you got, you know, your work for the day done and the admissions done. Maybe you could lie down for an hour or two and I put a headband on Oh my God. and the pager was on vibrate <laughs> on my headband. Just right on your forehead. And it was, <laughs> it was a little traumatic on my forehead. Yeah. Like when somebody paged me and my whole head started oh. vibrating. But I bet it woke it you up. It successfully woke me up. I didn't miss pages and, you know, problem solved. Man, I, I, I swear most doctors have this sometimes rational in your case, but irrational fear of missing a page, right? But pagers, yeah. they, they're so loud. I'm, I'm impressed that it just didn't wake you up, period. But but I, I felt that same kind of anxiety around like this going to sleep when I'm on call, you know, I, and I, similar to you, like I, I'd put the pager, I'd, I'd bring the stool over like right next to my sleeping head and put the pager like within four inches from my face. You know, I never went so far as to put a headband on, but, uh, <laughs> because it, you hear horror stories. Like I remember a, a, a resident who had, was a few years ahead of me, went to sleep with the pager on his belt and somehow was sleeping like on the the button of the pager and so it blocked pages from going through and just stuff like that just like really freaks you out right it's like oh if if, if no one pages me a first day intern people will die kind of thing which is 
not quite how things work in the hospital, but <laughs> not quite accurate. I think but, you, you know, might not that die far from if you don't answer either. it. Yeah, not that, not that. You're right, not that far off. But yeah, it, you know, um, you're mostly going to get in trouble with other people. I think if you're if you do that. <laughs> so that do you still do you do you are you on do you ever are you do you take call as an administrator? Is there like an administrator <laughs> on call? There is an administrator of on call. There's also a um, medical center physician on call to help with uh, thorny uh, clinical issues. And so we do take call. Um, but uh, these days, it's really just cell phone based. Gotcha. You don't and, strap uh, your cell phone to your head anymore. There's no cell phone strapped to the head, although, um, you know, might not be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> Were you, uh, um, uh, so aside from having difficulty waking up, did you have any other difficult, like, situations that you encountered <laughs> in your training uh lots of difficult situations in my training um and lots of funny ones as well i mean um knowing that i was going to become a pediatrician i i thought gosh you know i want to be like the patch adams right i uh i learned to juggle in in college i learned you know like card tricks and tying a bow tie and balloon animals and medical school is part of like the pediatric interest group right oh my gosh <laughs> yeah none of that was helpful at all it never really got a chance, like opportunity to bust out my juggling skills on rounds, <laughs> or balloon animals. No, there might have been one or two balloon animals. I bet you're fun at parties until though. they outlawed latex. Yeah, you you must have been a big hit with your kids' uh, uh, birthday parties and stuff, right? Birthday parties probably you know more helpful. In fact, uh, my now wife, who you guys met, mm -hmm. uh, was a professional nanny. And I remember that uh, people would tell her, oh, you're so lucky you're marrying a pediatrician. He's going to be so useful. <laughs> and my wife was like, yeah, he's he's useless, like, unless the kids are sick, in which case he says, you know, I can't be their doctor. He's just going to the doctor. So pretty much, you know, completely useless. Whereas my wife, who um, has raised several other um, children before we got married, uh, you know, was very, very useful. You think, you think you're useless. Imagine being an <laughs> ophthalmologist. That's, I think that's, if we're, if we're creating a list, I don't know, I don't know what's, that would be a fun thing to do, go through like the top five, like useless professions in like a non-clinical, like, you know, just being at yes, home with I your think, family. you know, a list of people that would be more useful Radiologists than you all. Radiologists probably be up there. Pathology, yeah. I mean, but they understand like diseases pretty well. And mm -hmm. so like I think a what wide you really variety. need is, is a nurse. Yeah, I think nurse, nurses are probably like, the best yeah you know because they got like the the triaging skills and the right. and... followed by whoever the primary caretaker is yeah yeah we regardless need... of whether they I have any medical training my problem is i need too much equipment like i require too mm -hmm. much stuff to do my job uh pediatrician though i mean you, you really don't have much of an excuse chris you're you're you know you don't you need a stethoscope and some stickers and a and some safety suckers and then and you should be able to do anything <laughs> and a unicorn headband yeah. that's <laughs> do right you, do you have a unicorn headband I, I can't remember if i gave you one you didn't give me one but i did pull it out i've got pictures of us oh, oh that's right uh, <laughs> oh that's right it, it was homemade you, he made Jared. so i went uh just backstory i i did uh the reason chris and i know each other is uh because i came and gave a talk to um or both of us did together yeah our whole family yep. we brought the yep. kids with us to the it was all of UCS, like the whole hospital was invited and mostly, um, the trainees and med students. And, um, and so when I showed up, Chris had fashioned a, or I, let's be honest, uh, did you do it yourself or did someone do it for no, you? No, my chief of staff. Yeah. Did <laughs> cool. Because when Jared you're a CMO, you get other people to do stuff for you. Uh, so, um, uh, made their own unicorn headbands, which I was very impressed by. Jared is like Jonathan. I mean, I can't live without him. Jared is great. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that you actually set up your own audio and video for this podcast yourself. I assumed I would see him in there, getting it all ready for you. I mean, you don't even drive your own car; you let your car drive for you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so as your role of the CMO, um, I'm sure you have gotten pretty good about managing like difficult confrontations and like uh um what do you call it like conflict resolution is that a big part of your job i imagine it is 
I would say it's not a small part of my job. Is it? Uh, is it the least your least favorite part of the administrator role? Actually, I'd, I'd like to hear what that is. <laughs> um, the conflict resolutions always come up. You know, any yeah. leadership role, by the time things um, get escalated to you, they're not easy problems to solve, right? Yeah. And uh, it's always a trick to understand where people are coming from, what they're looking for. Um, you know, a good compromise means that nobody's happy, right? And right. uh, they can be, um, you know, coming out of a situation, you, you can have sort of a win-win, you can't have a lose-win because that's always a lose-lose. Mm -hmm. oh. So there's uh, lots of opportunities to help people see a bigger picture. Sometimes the answer is not uh, no, but not now. Um, so a variety of things, you know, have uh, been effective. Basically the same things you use with your patients in pediatrics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or your children as a parent, I would think. It's That's just, exactly These right. are all just grown-up children, so a lot of the same. <laughs> Some of us not so grown-up. <laughs> I'd say I'd say so. That's fair. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, that's what you're doing. I think as a parent is just basic. You know, this is how it works to be a human and to to interact socially with people. So I think there's probably a lot of overlap. There are definitely Fridays I go home and I think about that book. You know, everything I need to know I learned yeah. in kindergarten, and I think, man, if we just had some posters of those learnings, you know, around the hospital, right. which would be really helpful. <laughs> you should do that. Yeah, it could do a little um, information campaign poster, and you know, yeah. everything you need to know. Just have a kindergarten teacher come and help with your. Oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> with decorating your hallways. Not a bad idea. <laughs> um, and so you said you work. You still work uh, about what a half day a day clinical seeing patients. Yeah, that's right. Um, when I was at uh, Stanford, I worked as a pediatric hospitalist, uh, which was much more of a high acuity uh, setting. It was something I really enjoyed in the pediatric hospital medicine group there. It's fantastic. Part of the reason that I could continue doing that sort of on a pretty part-time basis is because it was where I had trained, right? I remembered that, uh, you know, all the nooks and crannies and I knew all the subspecialists and, and how to get things done and who to contact. And moving here to UC San Diego with a larger administrative role, um, first of all, I knew that I wouldn't have as much time to practice clinically. And secondly, this is an adult health system. So the only um, pediatrics we have are are the babies, uh, newborn, a uh, neonatal intensive care unit. And then occasionally we get pediatric patients in our emergency department and our burn unit, which is the only regional burn unit. Um, and so it was a natural transition for me to uh, go to sink babies. And I'll mm -hmm. be honest with you, as a as a resident, newborn medicine was not my favorite um, stop. Oh, really? Um, particularly before you have kids, you know, there's a lot of healthy children and your baby's so beautiful. And, and then suddenly you have kids and it's a whole different perspective. You know what it's like to be in that bed, yeah. all the fears that you bring and all the hopes and dreams. And actually I've had a lot of fun doing newborn medicine uh, uh, down here. Um, I spent uh, about seven and a half years moonlighting in neonatal ICU as well um, before I uh, paid off all my loans. Um, and the pager headband, you know, worked really well yeah. in the NICU setting where I was the moonlighter. <laughs> but, that sounds um, terrifying. Well, I mean, just it a neonatal terrifying. ICU by itself, Yeah, that sounds like the scariest possible place in a hospital. Um, uh, and so it, moonlighting, like being the only, I assume the only physician kind of on the unit, right? Um, at uh, I don't imagine you were getting a whole lot of sleep. No, not a lot of sleep. I didn't have to wear the headband that much because I'd just stay up babysit the sick kids and go to the delivery. So it was a lot of fun and I learned a ton. And uh, the neonatologist came in when needed, but uh, you know, there were times when you were doing procedures by the book, with the book at the bedside. <laughs> Literally by the book. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, doing one particular procedure and the, the nurse who was assisting and caring for the baby looked at me and said, now, Dr. Longhurst, um, you've done this procedure before, right? And oh, I no. said, absolutely, it's not going to be a problem. <laughs> yeah, you're cut out for administration. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think you always got the right answer, I've noticed here. <laughs> or at least, at least you have, true or not. At least you have the answer detail. that'll piss off the fewest amount of people. That's right. <laughs> Very I diplomatic. That's, I think that's probably a key, a key part of it. Uh, did you, uh, a, important question, uh, did you ever have to consult an ophthalmologist? 
Yes. In fact, um, we love our pediatric ophthalmologists in the neonatal ICU because retinopathy or prematurity yes. is something that can um, that, that, cause blindness, as you know. That's also one of the scariest things in ophthalmology. And so credit to not only pediatric ophthalmologists, but retina specialists. I think it's different yeah. with... Because the eyeball, even the adult eyeball is already very small. So then make that a neonatal sized and then yes. put it at the very back of the eyeball and make it even smaller because it's just the retina. Like, how do you even? Yeah, it's a it's a really difficult thing. Um, and actually, as a resident, I, I didn't get I learned about retinopathy of prematurity, but maybe once or twice did I ever step foot in a neonatal ICU because it's like it is as specialized care as you get. In fact, I'd say probably most pediatric ophthalmologists don't treat ROP because there's only, you know, so many places, right? There's not a lot of community hospitals that have, you know, neonatal ICUs that can handle that type of care. Um, but it is, it is very specialized and, um, and very challenging, very challenging work. So I do not envy the, uh, I'm glad yeah, we have shout them, out to but those people. my God, it's, that's, that's tough work. And, um, and you, I'm, I'm, also, you, you have, as an ophthalmologist, you have to go to the hospital, which, as we've covered in this podcast, is not the easiest thing for us to do. So It's not the easiest thing to find an ophthalmologist to come to the hospital, which is part of the reason we're so grateful for our retinal specialists to do. Uh, it's a requirement for every, every uh, level three NICU, and for good reason, because it helps to prevent really bad outcomes in babies. And so oh, wow. Okay. Desperately uh, needed specialty. And it kind of reflects something that, that I love about being in this role as well, which is that uh, as much as everybody likes to complain about the electronic health record and, uh, you know, the hours and pay and the staff and, <laughs> and anything the else they can find to complain about, <laughs> um, ultimately people have all gone to, gone into, uh, this profession for, um, a similar reason, which is wanting to help people. Yeah. Um, you know, there's lots of other ways to make money, um, possibly lots more money. I'm watching the show billions now and like, well, if I wanted to be rich, obviously I should have been a hedge fund, you know, uh, amateur stock trader. Or a nanny for um, the stars. That's right. Or a nanny to the stars. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> yeah. um, you can get paid quite well if you uh, end up in that role. <laughs> well, I, I, it's, it's, and I'm sure like with the pandemic, it's just been so much more difficult having to, you know, navigate some of the issues that healthcare workers have about their jobs, about being overworked and feeling underpaid and undervalued. That's probably just the pandemic just made that so much more difficult, um, uh, to, to, to manage. And, uh, but having that underlying grounding, you know, um, motivation of patient care, I think is probably pretty helpful, right? Absolutely. To fall back on. That, that's probably what ties us all together. Um, but we're definitely at a sea change. You know, uh, there were generations of physicians before you and I, Will, who, uh, you know, went into the profession knowing that they would essentially be on call 24 7. Um, and I remember um, uh, when I started training and there was a transplant surgery fellow, and uh, he literally took call every day. And I, I saw him in the hospital once. I was like, where do you live? And he's like, here. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no. I mean, are you, are you close by? And he goes, well, I have some stuff in a storage locker close by. Oh but, my goodness. You know, that, that was it's like straight of out of one of my skits. Yeah. <laughs> it it <laughs> is. And that, that was sort of a, you know, generation of, uh, learners who, who felt there was nobility in that complete sacrifice of oneself. Right. Um, in fact, that's where the term house officer comes from. Yeah. Right. Um, but, uh, you, you know, it's, a, it's a new uh, era and people recognize the need to take care of themselves if they're going to take care of others in a humanistic and, and right. empathetic way. And so uh, I think we as a profession and as a society will need to struggle with that because we already pay so much for healthcare in the United States, um, understanding, you know, how, well, how can we rebalance things if it's going to take more workers to do the same amount of work? Uh, there's not a lot of great options. Yeah, agreed. Well, let's take a little break, and then we're going to come back with uh, Chris Longhurst, a CMO at UCSD Hospital System, and we're going to play a little game. It's going to be fun, but probably also a little bit uncomfortable for you. So <laughs> we'll be right back with Chris. 
Kristen, you know that as an ophthalmologist, I don't tend to get excited about stethoscopes. I do know that, yes. But I have around my neck the Echo Health's 3M Litman Core Digital Stethoscope. This thing is incredible. It's got active background noise cancellation up to 40 times amplification. That's pretty impressive. It, I could practically hear the individual myocytes talking to each other. And I have one too, and mine is rainbow. Yours is much cooler than mine. I know. I might just wear it around the house with its noise cancellation so I don't have to hear you and the kids. That's fair. You know, this thing would be a perfect gift for anybody in healthcare. What? So, we have a special offer for our U.S. audience. Visit echohealth.com slash KKH and use code NOC50 to experience Echo's digital stethoscope technology. That's E-K-O Health slash KKH and use NOC50 to get $50 off plus a free case plus free engraving with our exclusive offer. <laughs> All right, we are back with Chris Longhurst. All right, Chris, we, Chris, Chris. You're too used Chris. to saying Kristen. <laughs> Kristen, that's right. <laughs> Chris, we are going to uh, play a little game I came up with like last night. Um, that's called "Do we have the budget for this? Do we have the?" So what I did was I went to Twitter and I posed a tweet. <laughs> He's already nervous. He's already nervous about this. <laughs> I um, I said, uh, "Okay, you have." you have a meeting with the CMO at your hospital and you can give them that you can give that person one request and they have to fulfill that request. All right. What is that request? Uh, and the only caveat I said, you can't ask for more money because I mean, like that's something probably everybody would, would have asked. And some people still asked for that as one of their things. Um, and so I just said, you can't ask for more money. I got about a thousand responses, <laughs> Chris. All right. A, a thousand replies and quote tweets about this. Uh, and what I'm going to do is go through some of my favorite, some of them, uh, some of the, also some of the more popular ones that I saw. Okay. So we're going to start with perhaps certainly one of the most popular, uh, requests of the CMO, which would be free parking. So Chris, do we have the budget for this? No. <laughs> <laughs> What's the parking so, situation at UCSD? Well, it's funny you bring that up because that's one of the most common complaints that we face, not only from our physicians, but also from our uh, patients. Yeah. So being part of the university, we do not offer free parking. We're not allowed to. We have a parking garage where patients have to pay for parking. Oh, no. And uh, we have uh, a doctor's parking lot. In fact, one of the most angry physicians I, I've encountered that in this role uh, strode into the uh, C-suite once, bitter about the fact that he'd seen multiple people in the doctor's parking lot without the doctor's permit. And he wasn't wrong. And we, you know, said, hey, we'll, we'll go check into this. But that was like one of those de-escalating kind of uh -huh. situations that you train for in your active shooter. You know, uh, <laughs> That sounds like one of those things you say, okay, yeah, we'll look into this, but you never look into it. I looked into it in like in 48 minutes and uh, we actually did a cleanup and uh, put up some new signs and did some patrolling and, gotcha. you know, towed all the patients that had parked. Oh, them. good. Oh, Jeez. gosh. <laughs> parking sucks. It, you can't solve that one. Parking, yeah, that's that's a really, that's a difficult one. Parking is is challenging. Um, okay, so the next most common, this is going to be the hardest one, I think. Um, more nurses, increased staffing. Now, I, in my practice, like we're, this is a constant thing, trying to get more staffing, trying to get more. So, so Chris, do we have the budget for, so I saw some requests are like quadruple the staff and which sounds easier said than done, I imagine. But, uh, do we have this, do we have the budget for this, Chris? Yes and no. Oh, Okay. So the answer on this one is that in California, where we have mandated ratios of nurses can care for no more than four patients, even in low acuity settings, it's actually not a common concern that we get as uh, around the staffing. Mm -hmm. The concern we hear is the type of staffing, because as you know, we've experienced this great resignation mm -hmm. and nurse staff in particular are difficult to hire. 
So we've partnered with local colleges. We're trying to get graduates, but everybody wants the experienced uh, uh, best nursing staff for their patients. And so we're always trying to balance, you know, how do we use contractors and travel nurses, float pool versus kind of the staff who we can employ at schedule, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are, so I didn't realize that there was a, a mandated, a mandated uh, staffing ratio in California. That seems like a, a, actually a good idea for other places to incorporate because it's a patient yeah, safety Yeah, how thing, common is that, right? do you think? So I can't speak for other states. Um, I can say when that passed, there was a lot of support from the nursing unions in California. And I'm sure that that's because there have been some abuses of staffing ratios and inappropriate things done. Oh, yeah. Um, but it's not always the case that, uh, you know, that that improves safety as well. So there's some arguments on both sides. It is what it is here in California. And, uh, you know, keeping up with those ratios is going to cost a predictable amount of money when those nurses are not our employees, but travel nurses and the like who make a lot more. Uh, that's when the budget uh, gets busted. Gotcha. In fact, uh, just to, to take a tangent for a minute, uh, I'm quite worried the next couple of years, hospitals are going to be in a difficult position. Did you know last year was the worst um, year on, on record financially for hospitals since they kept records? Really? And over half of ho hospitals ran in the red. Um, and it's really uh, at least three things driving this, right? One of them is the great resignation and the cost of labor has gone up 10, 12, 13%. Mm -hmm. And that's really difficult to sustain, right? And then combine that with things like more unionization, demanding higher wages, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The second is the supply chain costs, right? So just like your eggs cost more, like inflation's hitting the hospitals. So now imagine that you're paying, let's say 15% more for supplies, 12 to 13% more for labor. But then you go to negotiate with payers like, say, Anthem and Blue Cross and Blue Shield, and they offer you 1% rate increases. Right. And hospitals already run on this tiny, thin margin. So how do you reconcile all that? That's really, really difficult that it's going to be a tough couple of years. I think that speaks to something that is on people's minds right now. Like, I think the the patient perspective or the, the non-medical or hospital perspective is these procedures are so expensive and it costs me so much money to come to the doctor or to get a surgery or, or whatnot. And I think the perception is that that's because the doctors are pocketing that money, right? That, that you guys just get paid so much. So Chris, can you speak to where does all that money go? If it costs so much, how come hospitals are in the red? It's a great question, and uh, we are not pocketing money. Now, uh, it's not a poorly paid profession. I mean, you, you see the ophthalmologists sometimes walk out with cash strapped around their chest. <laughs> not supposed to talk but, about that here. But for the rest of us, um, you know, the, the uh, compensation is, or the compensation for procedures and surgeries and things like that, it's covering a lot of different things, right? It's not just the physicians, it's all the staffing, the supplies, the electricity, the technology everything that goes into providing care safely, right? And in fact, um, you can provide some of the same procedures at lower cost in outpatient settings, right? And there's been a, a movement towards that, but it's a balance. You can't overdo that because sometimes those procedures, while rare, may have complications. And if you have a complication having one of those procedures, you better damn well be in a setting where you've got the support to rescue. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, we got a, a, a number of these, so let's go. Let's keep going. So I'll, some of them, you know, were only like one or two people asking for. Um, so this is from, um, a user, uh, at empiric game said, um, they would ask for a second bladder scanner for a seven floor hospital. So Chris, do we have the budget for a second bladder scanner for a seven floor hospital? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. You can what is have a bladder scanner. Can, so it's, it, you gotta you use a bladder scanner to determine how much urine is in the bladder and whether or not you need to do a catheter to, you know, drain the bladder because oh, okay. it can be dangerous to, man, I still remember some of this Look stuff. At that. Look at that. That's, That's what really a bladder good, scanner is. Well, bladder scanners for everyone. <laughs> everyone gets a bladder <laughs> scanner. Okay. Here we go. Um, 24 seven child care. Ooh. 24-7 child care. This came from a couple of users at Gong Gas Girl asked for it. So do we have the budget for 24-7 child care? 
24 seven is difficult, but we should be supporting childcare. And in fact, that's something that uh, is a benefit for us here in the health system being part of a university. There is childcare for university employees. And so it's definitely not 24 seven. That would be hard to do. Um, and that's something that we should be looking at. Awesome. Well, and uh, what's the implication there? Like, are, are like they gotta, asking for free childcare because I, they work yeah. here or? Well, I think everybody would love expensive. cheap, would love affordable childcare. I think right. probably affordable childcare. So if the university employee childcare is still yeah. prohibitively expensive, is that helpful? Yeah, I don't know. I just don't, I don't think like, and certainly have, you know, single parents who would, who potentially would benefit from like an overnight childcare situation, but uh, that or would Or if you're the night do. shift. Um, or if you're anybody but an ophthalmologist. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's see. Let's do it. So, um, here's one, uh, forgive all medical debt <laughs> at Pranish K Pr Pr Pranish K asked for that. Uh, so Chris, do we have the budget to forgive all medical debt? Absolutely not. I was, uh, I was afraid you'd say forgiving that. Forgiving medical debt is beyond the scope of the chief medical officer. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have the authority to make that decision. No, I do not. But that's probably good advocacy for our U.S. Surgeon General and, and other healthcare leaders and uh, the federal government. There you go. There you go. So ask those people for sure. Don't ask your local CMO uh, because they won't be able to accomplish that. Uh, Non-dairy creamer in the doctor's lounge. Some people had a little bit more of a um, uh, you know, a higher level view of, of this question. <laughs> <laughs> so non-dairy creamer in the doctor's lounge. Absolutely. Do we have the budget Done. for that? We do. I, you know what? Not only do we have the budget, Jared's going to go do that right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. I got uh, just a few more here. I really actually like this one. A uh, nursing level family or patient liaison for each specialty available to be contacted for up to two weeks post discharge. I love that. I think it's a great idea. I love that as well. Um, we have a uh, family and patient experience team and uh, they actually do provide services along those lines. Serve an ombudsman person kind of role, um, can review things, provide advice, et cetera. So um, I think that's a really important um, opportunity for any health system to provide. And there's actually some regulatory requirements around it. For example, did you know that every written complaint requires a written response? Oh, really? No, I did not know that. Is it common for, for hospitals to have those sorts of things? Or is that just like a perk at UCSD? I would say that it's universal for hospitals to have those sort of things. The question is, what is the culture? How is it resourced and staffed? Yeah. Is it a yeah. complaint department, you know, uh, that's reporting through legal that gets back to written complaints? Is it a patient and family experience department? Um, and not to boast, but I think we've done a good job of really trying to, you know, um, align with patients and, and be advocates for the right care. Because truth be told, uh, we don't always provide the right care, right? And there's a lot of uh, opportunities to learn from that. And what's great is that Chris is personally responding He's doing the, the right. written response he stays to all up at the, night the and written complaints. Writes handwritten. Notes. So thank thank you for that. Th that's exactly correct. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this next one came from uh, uh, Macklemore Mr. Actually, uh, several people said this. Um, they would ask for the resignation of the CMO and the abolishing of the position. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe if we did that, then we'd have a little bit more money for non-dairy creamer in the doctor's lounge. Or maybe we could have both, but I hear you. <laughs> um, it's funny how easy it is to uh, point at others and uh, find uh, problems instead of solutions. But, uh, you know, it takes uh, people in leadership roles to help make uh, health systems run. Yep. And uh, from my perspective, the more physicians who have trained and come up through uh, the same you know, mm -hmm. practices we all have that, that are representing that, the better, right? I think and it, that, it's and, a deeper understanding. Yeah. And that's a, a refrain I heard a lot with the response to this tweet was, you know, more, more people who have taken care of patients who have been in the system, you know, really helping people in that way, moving into leadership roles, which I agree with. I think that's a great 
a, a thing to have both perspectives, right? To have that patient care perspective. Um, yeah, well, we were talking earlier about kind of the sea change in medicine, right? You know, as, uh, generations have moved through. And uh, I remember hearing about the sea change in hospitals from uh, one of my former CEOs. And uh, he was talking about the fact that when hospitals started, it was really like the late 1800s, right? Some of the first hospitals in the United States. And who ran the hospitals? Doctors, yeah. right? And uh, doctors owned and ran hospitals right up until the 50s and 60s. And that's when this idea of healthcare administration you know, came about, um, concomitant with the advent of CMS, uh, you know, which was signed into law in 1965. And uh, by the 80s and 90s, this concept of kind of managed care and, and uh, you know, health maintenance organizations peaked, right? Mm -hmm. um, but his prediction was that uh, we would see the pendulum begin to swing back with more and more physicians helping to lead you know, health systems. I, I want to be clear, I've worked with some amazing healthcare administrators who don't come from clinical backgrounds. Um, my CEO has a master's in public health and she's phenomenal. One of the most empathetic, you know, um, healthcare leaders I've worked with. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that having more clinicians, physicians, nurses, and others in leadership roles will be good for healthcare as well. There you go. Uh, and then, uh, I got two more. All right. This came from at Harlem medic, uh, double ply toilet paper. Do we have the budget <laughs> for double ply toilet paper? You know, that's a phenomenal idea. We don't have the budget for it in all bathrooms, but we have the budget in the doctor's lounge. Oh. <laughs> that's it. The rest of you, uh, I don't know, use, uh, bring a towel. Bring your own. Know. Yeah. <laughs> bring your own double ply. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh, all right. And, and one more, the last one, you know, a lot of people asked for this, this is probably the most, uh, a common request, a functioning slit lamp in the emergency department. <laughs> <laughs> By a lot of people, you mean you. Oh, maybe. I mean, yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah. you know, I just, I saw it, um, uh, in my head. And so I assumed everyone else was asking for it as well. So, um, yeah. yeah. But, you know, I think it's really critical that every emergency department has a functioning slit lamp and that every newborn nursery has a functioning transcutaneous Billy Ribbon uh, checking uh, machine. <laughs> you, you heard it here first. All right. This is coming from uh, a chief medical officer at a major health system. Every emergency department needs to have a slit lamp and whatever it is that he said as the second thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Chris. So we're going to uh, come back here in just a second with um, our uh, a couple of fan stories before we let you go. Okay. Be right back. Sounds great. Okay. Let's take a look at some of our favorite medical stories that were sent in by you, the listeners. We still have Chris Longhurst here. He's, he's going to listen to these stories with us. All right. So we have, um, a, a, this is an anonymous story. As a pre-med student and undergrad, I worked at an urgent care clinic as a medical assistant. One particular patient encounter will always stand out amongst the rest. As I began triaging this patient who was complaining of a sore throat, she asked if she could get a COVID test as well. Not thinking much of it, I asked her if she had any known sick contacts recently. The patient replied that she hadn't been around anyone sick, but she was concerned she may have contracted COVID-19 from her pet hamster. Apparently... The hamster had seemingly died, so she administered CPR with mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breaths to it. Miraculously, she told me that she was able to successfully resuscitate her pet hamster, but it died anyway shortly after. She was at least comforted to learn that she could not contract COVID from her beloved pet. Boy, did our scribe get a thrill out of typing up that HPI. <laughs> I, this is incredibly impressive to me. See, like, can you imagine, like, CPR on a on a hamster, like, to successfully mouth. resuscitate a hamster? I mean, whoever sent that in, I, I'm I am I'm just very impressed by that. If you're listening to this, it, you should write a book about, um, or at least a guide on hamster resuscitation. In my opinion, that's quite a story. Isn't that it, great? Although it's possible the hamster died of attention pneumothorax after the resuscitation. It's, <laughs> hey, you know what? But at least the hamster got a few more minutes. <laughs> um, so there you go. I like that. That's great. All right, Alex. Uh, this is a story from um, uh, user Alex. Uh, I have a medical story from my intern year. On my first overnight shift, my resident went to take a nap and left me the phone. Being nervous, 
When I got a phone call for an admission, I quickly write down patient information and ran to wake up my resident. Unfortunately for me, my resident was sleeping on the futon in our conference room, which had a glass door that was closed. I didn't see the door and ran into it hard enough to split open the skin just above my eyebrow. I grabbed some tissues and thought I was able to stop the bleeding before we went to see the patient. But after we got back to the workroom, I saw blood had actually been dripping down my head (laughs) probably the entire time. I had to go back to the ED for stitches and only have a small scar. (laughs) I like that this, that there's an assumption here that the, that we have to make as the listener uh, that the patient noticed blood dripping down their doctor's head (laughs) and did not say a word about it. (laughs) Oh, Oh, man. That's great. We all have stories. I I love, like, trainee story. Like, stuff like that, I feel like it only happens to, like, people in training. It's it's great. We all have stuff like that. Not like that, but, you know, anyway. All right. (laughs) Thank you for those stories. Send us yours. Knock, knock, hi at human dash content. Dot com. Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's it's really, I, I love chatting with you and I love hearing your perspective on all things administration. Thanks for giving us some of your time on Jared's busy day. Yeah. You bet. And thank you guys for uh, everything that you do. It's really uh, making a difference. Now, do you have something that you want to promote? Is anything going on in UCSD? I understand there's a, um, you've got a, a new center for health innovation. Is that right? Yes, we do. In fact, uh, we're just preparing to announce um, a large gift for Center for Digital Health Innovation, which is really going to uh, be taking advantage of these new technologies to transform the way we deliver care. So um, besides you on Twitter, uh, a lot of the other chat has been about ChatGPT and Mm. all the amazing responses it can have. Let's think about in a meaningful way how uh, AI and other uh, types of uh, technologies can help support the delivery of better patient care. Is Jonathan going to be replaced by chat GPT? Uh, I think Jonathan might be the author of he chat might GPT. Be chat he GPT. might. I think he is chat GTP. Nope. It's possible. G- Fortunately, GPT? Jonathan got into medical school. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, and that is healthinnovation.ucsd.edu if you want to check that out. And Chris, we can find you on Twitter. You are, you follow this guy. He's, he's great. Um, Chris Longhurst. I'm not sure what your handle is, but you, I think you're the only Chris Longhurst out there. So C A Longhurst. C A Longhurst. That's what it is. All right. Well, thanks again for being here, and we'll let you go back to your very important busy job. Take care. Oh, so much fun talking to Chris. Yeah, he's you know, we, a blast. Yeah, it's you know, it, it's uh, I appreciate people who can kind of laugh at themselves Mm -hmm. and i mean i'm pretty like merciless to to like ceos and stuff and people in these in you know leadership positions uh you know uh, in my in my content and making skits and i i appreciate that someone like him can see the truth in it and still laugh at themselves and so um but it was really cool to hear his perspective on a lot of the common issues that people are having yeah. And healthcare, you yeah, know. and you can tell that he like he cares, right? I think that's yeah. what makes a good healthcare administrator is that empathy and and being able to take different perspectives. And I think where where it can go wrong is when you don't have that. And um, I still think he could, you know, he could probably forgive all medical debt. I, I don't, oh, I, I was gonna say he could probably spring for the two ply. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> at least the two ply, and yeah. then we'll talk about forgiving all the medical debt. All right. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, thanks to Chris and, uh, thank you for the stories. Uh, and if you have any other stories to share, please let us know. All right. We want to uh, hear what you thought about the episode. Uh, do you want us to bring on more hospital administrators? Do you like hearing uh, their perspective on things? Do you know other people that we should have on? Let us know. All right. Hit us up in the comments. Uh, there's other ways to hit us up as well. Uh, you can email us knock, knock high at human dash content.com can visit us on our social media platforms youtube tiktok twitter uh you're on instagram kind of yeah i'm, I'm trying to get a little we more active have a over great there. instagram I have plans for, my, for the instagram but i it's, can only it's... handle so many social media <laughs> platforms i know it gets to be a lot uh and um let's see you can also hang out with us and our human podcast human human content podcast family on instagram and tiktok at human content pods 
Thank you to all the great listeners leaving feedback, awesome reviews. We really appreciate it. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, all right, we may shout you out like this. Shout you out. Shout you out. Sh- shout shout you out. out. Pink Pearls 37 on Apple said, as an avid true crime connoisseur and medical professional, this podcast has been a funny, informative breath of fresh air. I was immediately hooked after you showed up on my For You page and was so excited when you announced this podcast, the perfect blend of humor and truth about life in the medical field. 10 out of 10 will recommend. Thank you so much, Pink Pearls 37. Uh, That's very nice of you. Full video episodes are going up every week on my YouTube channel, D Glock and Flecken. Uh, We put those out every Tuesday. Uh, There's lots of cool perks on our Patreon as well, so you can check that out. Uh, We have bonus episodes where we react to medical shows and movies. Come hang out with the Knock Knock High community. We are there. We're responding. I'm posting videos like talking about our life and content and just whatever comes to mind. Eyeballs. Eyeballs. Early ad-free episode access, interactive Q&A live stream events. A lot more coming as well. Patreon.com slash Glockenflecken or go to Glockenflecken.com. Speaking of Patreon community perks. New member shout out. We got Gracie L, Marie R, Alyssa A, Linda B, Lori C, and Joshua G. Thank you for joining our community. Shout out to all the Jonathans. All right, Jonathans out there. We got Patrick, Lucia C, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Abby H, Stephen G, Roskbox, Jonathan F, a Jonathan who's a Jonathan, Marianne W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Griana L, and Dr. J. Patreon roulette. It's time for Patreon roulette. So, uh, when what is Patreon yeah, roulette? It's, if you're uh, in emer- if you're on the emergency physician level of Patreon, uh, we will kind of randomly shout you out. Just choose somebody. And so, uh, let's just do the drum roll. Okay. Yeah, dude. I'm, I'm better at it. Yeah, yeah. You should do it. Shout out to Tucker P for being a patron. Uh, thank you all, and thanks for listening. We're your host, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock and Flecken. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Christopher Longhurst. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, Shanti Brooke. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omar Benzvi. To learn about our Knock Knock Highs, program disclaimer and other policies, submission verification and licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, you can go to glockandflecken.com or reach out to us at knockknockhigh at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or fun medical jokes you might have. I did that all in one breath that That time. You're getting pretty good at that. Pretty good. All right. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.